Mr. Pre- Dr. Schlissel? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> are you here and are you ready to speak with us? I'm here and I'm all yours, yeah. Great, thank you so much. You have time now to speak. Uh, thanks very much, Carla, and, and thanks everyone for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> I know this has been a really challenging semester with lots of stress and anxiety. Uh, it, it doesn't have the same level of joy that you know I'm used to seeing that you're used to experiencing amongst Michigan students. So I, I commend you for hanging in there. You know we're almost through. Um, you know Thanksgiving break is coming up, and then some a week or 10 days of remote learning and finals, and then a nice long winter break. So uh, we, we're almost there. And uh, I'm just sorry, it's been so rough on everybody, all of us, your, your, your teachers, uh, the staff of the university, and certainly the students. It's just a, a tough time for all of us with the pandemic. But what I wanna spend a little bit of time doing is just filling in for you, uh, the university's thinking behind what we've been trying to do during the pandemic uh, with uh, education. Uh, and then I'm happy to answer any questions you have and, and get any advice or suggestions or criticisms you might like to offer as we all figure out how to move forward together. You know, the, the good news from this past week uh, was a couple of vaccines uh, look as if they're gonna be highly effective and they, the data hasn't been published. It's just newspaper reports really, uh, but we didn't know until very recently that it was even possible to make a vaccine against the uh, disease COVID-19. Uh, It looks like the vaccines may be approved by the end of the year. Uh, Then the federal government will decide how to give out limiting doses of things. Uh, Probably will go to healthcare workers first early in the new year. And then people with predisposing conditions or people who are older who are more at risk. And then ultimately it'll be available for everybody. Uh, The vaccine will be free. Uh, The university will figure out how to get everybody who wants to be vaccinated, and I hope that's everybody, how to get you your doses, and we'll take care of it here during the uh, uh, winter semester. I hope it comes during the winter semester, so at least we can sort of start to begin to see uh, what the horizon looks like. Uh, Part of what's been so hard this fall is we didn't know how long this is going to last. It just felt like it was forever. It still feels like it's forever. Uh, But uh, my goal or our goal, the goal of the university leadership during the pandemic, has been to try our best to provide the best educational experience that we can for as many students as we can, uh, while keeping the risk of transmission of the disease under the best control we can keep it. Uh, It was really important to us to keep students enrolled in school and make sure you continue to make progress towards graduation of whatever program you're in, uh, especially people who are running into economic problems because of the um, effects on the economy of the pandemic, the unemployment and the changes in family circumstances, wanted to be sure it didn't cause people to drop out or have to take a semester off uh, if we could at all avoid it. Um, We wanted to have some in-person class uh, and um, I wanted to discuss a little bit why and why we opened up the dorms. A lot of people said, and some schools, mainly private schools, um, have had their dorms essentially closed and everything fully remote. Uh, We recognize that there are some courses that you could really only teach in person and some that you can only teach well in person. Uh, um, uh, Courses, some courses in our nursing school, uh, laboratory courses in some of our science curricula or in engineering, uh, some arts courses or performance courses. Uh, You just can't teach well uh, online And we wanted those students to be able to take class so they could continue progressing towards their degree. Uh, Also, uh, a lot of the Michigan experience does happen outside the classroom. And we call it the co-curriculum. Some of it is programs offered by student life, but a lot of it is your clubs and things like student government and all the activities uh, that students do, Greek life, uh, uh, all the things we do on campus that add value to the education Um, that uh, would benefit from being at least partially in person. And the third reason we decided to have some in-person instruction and to keep the dorms open was recognizing that 70% or so of Michigan students don't live in the dorms, they live in town. And that those of you that live in town have to sign leases uh, almost a year in advance. So most of you are already hooked up with your place to live. And we thought that even if all our classes were online and the dorms weren't open, a lot of students would still end up back in Ann Arbor anyway. Uh, so it wouldn't really um, de-densify uh, the city and the campus. Uh, so we decided to go ahead and um, give it our best shot 
at trying to provide some in-person education. Uh, the dorms ended up being about two thirds of their normal capacity. A lot of people made the choice to study from home. I'm sure some of you have been studying from home. Um, uh, and to move forward with this kind of funny semester, trying to make it through the pandemic with uh, health and safety intact. Uh, some things have gone okay. Other things have not gone very well. We've tried to learn from these things. Um, one of the good pieces of news is we did end up getting a very high degree of compliance from everybody in our community, including students. So you walk across the Diag or you go to class, or even if I walk down Hill Street around or here on South U where I live, uh, almost everyone is wearing their masks. And people, most people are not in large groups. They're maybe by themselves or with one or two friends. Um, basically folks are by and large doing what we're asking. Not everybody, but by and large has been a lot of cooperation. Uh, really good news in our classrooms. Uh, there's been almost no transmission of COVID-19 in university facilities like classrooms. We did have one group of students who were um, lab partners in a lab course that got permission to have four people working in a lab group on a project. And one of those had COVID-19 and spread it to a couple of others. Those are the only examples of spread in the classroom that we've learned about all semester long. Uh, faculty and the GOs, the GSIs, the TAs, uh, who are very concerned, legitimately concerned about their own safety. Nobody's been uh, infected with COVID while teaching in a classroom. So that's good news. The masks work, the low density works, the ventilation works. Uh, same thing with the union, the league, uh, CCRB has been open uh, under low density for the last you know, few weeks. Uh, that has not been the source of spread, so that's all good. Uh, the bad part has been there's been uh, way too much transmission of COVID-19, particularly amongst undergraduates and particularly uh, both in our dorms and in town. Um, a lot of the transmission has been in social circumstances, although there are individual cases that are hard to figure out where they came from. Most of the time we're seeing clusters of cases. And when we talk to the students involved, they went to a social event. And you know it's hard to wear a mask and stay in small groups 24 seven week after week. Uh, but uh, the disease has this way of spreading when too many people get together in too small a space. And all it takes is one person who's carrying the virus and you don't always know that you have it. Uh, and there you go. So. Uh, we've had outbreaks in Markley and West Quad and South Quad and in a few of the Greek life houses, not all the Greek life, you know, most of Greek life has been uh, basically fine. Um, we've struggled to keep up with the demand for testing and I'll talk more about virus testing, which has become a real hot button issue on, on campus and elsewhere. Uh, the quarantine facilities up on North Campus, up in Northwood, when the year first started, we had set aside 600 single uh, spaces for quarantine. Uh, and uh, we made a huge mistake. We treated them like regular dorm rooms. So when you showed up, it was a regular empty dorm room and you were usually carrying a little bit of your stuff. And it was sometimes in the nighttime or uh, just a weird time of the day. And everyone was pretty stressed out to begin with. We didn't have any special care for people up there. Uh, so we just dropped the ball. And in the next few weeks, uh, we upped the game on quarantine to the point where uh, people are having okay experiences now. Nobody wants to be quarantined, but we've got a staff up there that's looking after everybody that moves in. Uh, there's an office uh, with the supplies. Supplies are dropped off in everyone's room. It's being treated more like a temporary hotel than it is like a dorm room, recognizing that you're not all set up to, you know, to live there. It's happened all of a sudden. So that's gotten better. Um, uh, we've had uh, some problems up there I'll mention in a minute. Um, Although most students have done a great job keeping themselves and their friends healthy, uh, some haven't, some haven't been as cooperative. Uh, some people who have tested positive for the virus have refused to speak to public health folks that are trying to figure out where it came from and try to figure out who contacts are so we can diminish spread. So that lack of uh, uh, cooperation has been tough. Again, not common, it's rare, but it, it creates a problem. Uh, we had two incidents where people up in quarantine decided to host parties while in quarantine. Uh, can you imagine? And you know, the, there's no way that you should be able to make an excuse and say that's someone else's fault that you hosted a party while you're in quarantine for an infectious disease. Um, and then also, and I think this is a tough one, and I'd love your advice about this. Um, 
the vast majority of students, as I said, are doing everything that we're asking. And the vast majority have made it through the semester without getting infected. Uh, some of the people who have been infected because of parties uh, and things that they know they shouldn't have been doing, look at us and they say, don't blame me, what do you expect? And um, I'm not sure how to think about that kind of a don't blame me excuse. Uh, we want to help everybody be as safe and healthy as they can by providing folks with as much education and as many opportunities to keep themselves safe. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, to a degree, you know, we all are responsible for our own safety, whether we're, you know, 18 or 20 or whether we're 62 years old like I am. Um, and then, you know, finally, the, one of the characteristics of this semester, perhaps the saddest, is this deficit in joy on the campus. Um, I used to walk across the diag just to watch students greet each other and the, the random hugs and the people who get together and giggle and you know, the students who haven't seen each other in three days and looks like they haven't seen each other in three years, the joy when they come together, you know, just the schmoozing and, you know, just the usual stuff, um, which makes this uh, in general, despite the fact that it's a, a hard university, a lot of work, it makes it a place with a lot of joy. And I think it's just been really hard to be joyful. And it's been a lot of weeks like that. It was, it was last spring when we had to go fully remote so darn quickly. Uh, it was a summer where most of you didn't have the things to do that you thought you were going to be able to do during the summer. And then it's a semester, which is mostly online. And with all these strictures and limitations on behavior, it just sucked the joy out of everything. So as we were planning for the winter semester, we tried to take advantage of the things we learned in the, in the fall, the things that worked, the things that didn't work, the things that people wanted us to do different or do better. We did surveys. I hope a lot of you filled out surveys. We did focus groups. We surveyed faculty, staff, and students. Uh, um, obviously, I spoke with some regularity to Sav and Amanda, although this is my first time visiting CSG this fall. Um, and what was weighing on us as we were figuring out what to do in the winter was this really high and increasing rate of COVID-19 all around the state of Michigan and all around the country. Um, every day, we're setting a new record, practically. Uh, and it's no longer uh, in the summertime and early fall, it was young people that were uh, the, the most frequently uh, infected. Not anymore, it's the whole population's infected. Um, about 15% of all the hospital beds in the state are now filled with COVID-19 patients. 20% of the ICU beds are full. Uh, it's getting to the stage, heading in the direction it was last spring, when it was overwhelming our ability to take care of people. And we're looking at the winter time when this type of virus called a coronavirus tends to peak other coronaviruses, other members of the family peak between December and March. So we're heading into the peak season. It's not even the peak season yet of this type of virus. And because it's winter, we're mostly indoors where we know spread is worse. Uh, and then it's also going to be flu season and influenza uh, also results in hospitalizations. And we don't know what happens if you get sick with the two of them. At the same time, we don't know whether it makes it even worse or how they interfere with each other. Uh, and we showed that what we did this past semester didn't work in terms of getting enough cooperation from a high enough percentage of people to diminish that social spread of infection. So whatever we did, we had to do something different because it wasn't working. And then finally, we got advice, uh, pretty strong advice from our School of Public Health faculty from the Washtenaw County Health Department, from the regents, um, uh, lots of sources of input. And that's what led us to this plan that we released about a week ago, uh, where we're only gonna have in-person courses that you could only teach that way that are required for programs. Um, we're not gonna require any faculty or any um, uh, graduate students to teach who don't wanna teach in person. They can teach remotely. That was a big contentious thing earlier this year, even though the classrooms proved to be safe. Uh, we're gonna lower the number of people in the dorms, give everybody a single room, charge them for a double, but give them a single just to lower the density uh, and just try to uh, uh, diminish transmission by having fewer people there. And then we're gonna implement mandatory testing where if you live in the dorm, you have to take one of these saliva tests, um, even if you're feeling perfectly well, uh, once a week, and we're gonna do the same thing for students living off campus who have any reason to come onto campus. If you're taking a class in person, if you're working on campus, if you're volunteering in a research lab, if you wanna use rec sports, or you know, if you wanna use the union, you'll have to take uh, one free COVID test each week, the spit in a tube kind of test. 
uh, and we've developed the capacity to do that. Um, uh, the last thing I'll talk about before I, I answer any questions you might have until uh, Carla tells me my time is up um, is the issues around testing, which I know testing has been really controversial. A lot of people have been very unhappy that testing isn't easier. You can't get more testing. You know, some schools are testing you know, all students multiple times a week. Uh, when we began the semester, uh, testing was very constrained at the university. We were relying on the health system and the health system's first responsibility is to take care of sick people, not healthy people. Uh, so they were using their tests on patients in the emergency room and patients in the hospital. And we've always been able to test anybody that has any symptoms of COVID-19. We give you a test right away. And then anybody who's a close contact as defined by the CDC, too much exposure to somebody that has been documented as having COVID-19. We've always been able to test everybody in that category. And then we did something called surveillance, which is what the public health epidemiology folks do, where you take a statistical number of people who don't have symptoms and you test them every week. And you use that to identify areas where there's excess disease and then you intervene where you see a cluster. Uh, some other schools have taken a different approach. Uh, Illinois is pretty famous. They got money from the state of Illinois and set up a system where they can test uh, all their students twice a week they made it mandatory. They linked it to ID cards and everybody was required to take a test. What happened in Illinois is the third week they had to shut down the campus because the first two weeks they had over a thousand cases. Now, you, you know, logically, the testing doesn't prevent disease, it detects disease. So they detected way over a thousand cases. They did one of these two week stay in shelter like we just had to do. And then things came under control again, and they were really good until about a month ago. And now this month, they've been having 50 to 80 cases every single day. So testing helps identify people and it helps put folks in quarantine, uh, but all by itself, um, it doesn't replace having to wear masks and staying in small groups and washing your hands, you know, those kind of interventions. Um, uh, we also, uh, this was also controversial, the Big Ten, paid for these daily antigen tests. So you can test people every single day. It's a test that isn't very sensitive. It misses people. But if you test them every day, it's supposed to add up and, and keep a, a group safe. Well, it turned out, although it's kept people off of the field and out of the locker room who have infections, about 150 student athletes tested positive this fall, even though they were getting more testing than anyone on campus. And that's out of about 800 student athletes that were active. So it doesn't prevent disease. You know, what, it detects disease. What prevents disease, masks, small density, hand washing, the relentless stuff that's such a pain, uh, that's what prevents disease. Uh, what we've done though, is we've built up our supply, our testing capacity. We're using a startup in town. So when the new semester, we've, we've ramped up now to about 10,000 tests a week. Uh, we want everyone to take a COVID test before they go home to make sure that we've lowered the likelihood of them bringing COVID-19 home to their folks if they go home. And then uh, in the new semester, we'll test everybody when they come back to town. Everyone should be tested. And then, uh, as I said, there'll be mandatory testing uh, once a week. Uh, we're going to tie it to uh, M cards to make sure that everyone does it. Uh, the reason why we had to make it mandatory uh, is uh, as, and this is the last thing before I open it up. Uh, you remember I mentioned at Markley, we had an outbreak of over 100 students became COVID-19 positive in two different clusters. So we tested everybody in Markley. We sent around a message that said, look, mandatory testing. We brought the testing as a pop-up right into the dorm so we could do it right on the spot. And we got about 80% of people to comply. And of those 80%, almost nobody tested positive, a fraction of a percent, very low. And then we sent another email saying, look, this is serious. Please come and get your test. A few people came, not many. And then finally, we said, we're going to cancel your residential contract for the semester if you don't come and get tested. So everybody came to get tested. Of that last group of people that we basically had to force to get tested, about 20% of them were COVID-19 positive. So that's really instructive to us. Voluntary testing. Um, has a very low rate of people being positive. The folks that comply easily and voluntarily are probably the same folks that are taking really good care of themselves and avoiding exposures. 
Uh, so we have to make it mandatory to make sure that we pick up folks that aren't taking it as seriously perhaps as some others. Uh, so uh, I'll end there, you know, hopefully uh, you will have a, a good and safe uh, Thanksgiving break, a good end to your semester, uh, a good winter break. Uh, I'm encouraging everybody who can to study from, from permanent home in the spring, just to make everybody safer. Uh, there's gonna be a ton of disease in the United States and a ton of disease in Ann Arbor. Uh, and uh, I think it's much safer to be in a small group of family than it is with a large group of friends. It's just, it's just too difficult to stay safe. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions or get any advice uh, that you might like to offer as you know, we work together to try to make it through to the other side of the pandemic. And uh, thanks a bunch again for the invitation. Uh, can I turn it back to you, Carla, to, to moderate or however long you, you have for questions? Yes. Um, yes, that's perfect. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions and my Zoom just freaked out because everyone's hand went up. Um, I saw Matthew first and then Liam. Go ahead. Yeah, I was quick to the trigger finger on that one. Um, hi, my name is Matthew. I'm hey, a junior uh, as setting in Ross. I had a quick question regarding the tuition increase. Um, you know, so everything's gone online. You know, there's been a lot of people that feel like they're paying more for a lesser product. And I was just curious if you could speak a little bit about that and how that's justified. Yeah, so as I mentioned uh, right up front, our goal is to maintain as much education at as high a quality as possible to provide online as many of the things that we can't do in person as possible, things like CAPS and career services and other programmatic things, and then to use financial aid to make sure that your fellow students don't end up having to drop out of school because mom or dad lost their job because their restaurant is closed. And you add all those things up, they have a cost. Uh, our biggest cost here at the university is our faculty. And the next biggest cost are the folks that take care of the buildings that you either live in or work in. Um, if um, we can't keep up with these costs, people lose their jobs. We can't stop paying people. And we want to continue to provide as many of the services as we possibly can. And we want to make it so the diploma that you end up with doesn't have an asterisk on it that says this isn't a real Michigan diploma, but it came during COVID. Uh, we want to make this as rigorous and as valuable an educational experience as we can uh, in the setting of the pandemic. And when it's over, we want you to be able to come back to a campus that's as robust and, and exciting and, and high value as it was when we had to go mostly remote. So for all those reasons, the university needs to charge tuition. Uh, the tuition increase was not paid by people on financial aid. You know, we just have a policy of cycling back the dollars. And 1.9% was this controversial increase. Uh, so it's really a few hundred dollars. So it's an, it was a necessity for us to continue to move forward and do all the things we need to do, uh, even though the education is significantly remote. Uh, and also the remote education isn't a cheaper education for us to deliver. We have the same number of faculty. There's technological demands are higher. Um, we're providing experts to help our faculty get better at teaching online. Uh, many faculty had never done it before. And of course, when you never have done something, you're not going to necessarily, unless you're a natural, I guess, you're not going to be good at it right away. So we provided them with um, uh, experts on online teaching to give them all kinds of instruction and coaching and technical support. And that's all cost more money too. So, um, but the most important thing is everyone can make it through school, regardless of the family's financial circumstances, without having to take a semester off. Uh, and make it through the pandemic and not slow down their course to graduation. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great. Uh, thank you. Liam, you can go next. Hello, President Schlossel. I hope you're doing well today. Um, so I hope that my question illuminates and helps give advice to some of the things you asked about. I'm from the state of Michigan. I've been a Michigan fan since before I can remember. The first song I learned was The Victors. And one of my favorite lines in The Victors is the leaders and the best. Before this year, I felt that was very much accomplished. I felt like I'd come to a great university. But this year, I felt that we have not lived up to that. The faculty voted that they did not have any confidence in you. And I think the big issue on campus right now is this idea of trust, this idea of why should we be trusting you? Why should these things be happening? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and the, the question I have for you is why should we have faith in you? Why should we have confidence in you to reassert us as the leaders and the best? 
Well, uh, apart from this leaders and best concept, when there are many great universities around the country, uh, so I'd like to think of us as one of the best institutions in the country. It's a little too arrogant for my taste to call us the leaders and the best, uh, but we're among the best. Um, what I tried to do during most of my comments, Liam, is explain what we did and why with the semester. Now, I don't have the ability, nor does any university leader, to hold the entire community harmless from a global pandemic. I can't make the virus go away. I can't set up a scenario where students, some students aren't tempted to get together and let their guard down and transmit disease. Um, I can't make people happy that are living under really challenging uh, uh, limited, li limitations and circumstances. So although I understand the frustration of students and my faculty colleagues, um, I'd ask them, you know, what would you literally do differently given what we knew at, at the time as we were trying to understand in real time how to make it through a pandemic. And depending upon if you're a glass half full or a glass half empty person, actually we've almost made it through the semester. You're gonna get full academic credit. You learned as much as you could learn. Uh, you're healthy, I'm looking at you, you're healthy. Your friends are probably healthy. No faculty member has gotten ill in a Michigan classroom. Um, so. It really, you have to ask hard, what do you mean when someone says, I don't have confidence in you? Um, I wish that I was as smart three months ago about the pandemic as I am now, because we've learned a lot. Um, you know, Always we can look backwards and say, gee, I wish there were things that we did differently or better. And especially when you're in a circumstance that no one's ever been here before. Uh, so um, you know, I would argue that although I'm very respectful of the fact that faculty were sincere in saying, we're not happy with what happened. Um, the more challenging thing is when I ask them, well, what would you do differently? Um, it, it's pretty challenging. They'd say more testing, but you know, um, we didn't have the capacity, we built the capacity, but I've given you some examples where testing helps. It's an important part of controlling a pandemic, but it's not a panacea. Uh, I think in hindsight, I wish we had more time to speak together as a community and gather ideas from a broader array of people. But I think some faculty were disappointed they weren't consulted more as we made decisions about how to move forward and universities are really very cons consultative cultures. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm respectful and, and, and recognize the unhappiness of a big hunk of faculty. Uh, I've asked all of them. I've met with the folks that uh, that promulgated these resolutions of, of unhappiness or, or lack of confidence, asking their advice and thinking and saying, what should we do differently? How can we work together? And I've tried to continuously address problems as they arise, trying to make the experience better and safer for everybody. So I don't know how much how much better to answer the question. It's a tough question, and I wish that I could have done more um, to hold more people harmless and make more people's lives as normal as possible. Uh, but I, we couldn't figure out how to do that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Ruby, you can go. Okay, thank you. Um, also, I don't, I feel like we don't have that much time left. So yeah. I just want to make a motion to extend time for 20 minutes if President Schlissel is. I can give you 10 more minutes. I'm about to pass out. I've been going at this at seven in the morning. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Thank you for giving us those extra minutes. Um, oh, I will put that the down. Point of order, can I make a motion to uh, limit response time? Okay. In such a way uh, that we can get to everyone's questions. Well, I'm happy to just listen if you'd rather I do that, Sam. That's that's cool with me. I, I'm, I'm interested in learning your thoughts too. So if you'd rather I keep quiet, I'm happy to listen. Sam, <laughs> do you, how did you want to make your uh, I'd I limit to a minute in response, I guess. Okay. I'll um, try my best to be succinct. <laughs> okay. A, does anyone object to an extension of time for 10 minutes with one minute response times? Okay. Seeing none, we begin. Okay. Uh, Ruby, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. So um, President Schussel, you mentioned that the university made various missteps in its initial response to COVID-19. And I wanted to know if the university's decision to take legal action against GEO, whose members were striking for safe working conditions is included in those regrets. And if not, uh, how do you rationalize that decision? 
Well, let me correct a misperception. You know, I wish I was smarter when the semester started and we may have done things differently, but I honestly don't have regrets. Uh, I think uh, the student body is, is healthy. They made it through the semester. You're gonna get credit for your courses. We've learned as we've gone along. We've built capacity where we didn't have capacity. Uh, so I, I, I really don't have regrets. Uh, um, the question around GEO, yeah, I, I am really disappointed that um, uh, GEO ended up striking. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's a tough one minute answer, but the reason why we ended up uh, filing for an injunction is the whole semester was threatened by the inability to see the resolution to a strike that the GEO three months earlier had signed a piece of paper pledging not to strike as part of uh, their last negotiation. The first week of the strike, there was an agreement that the members voted down. Uh, the second week of the strike, uh, there was um, uh, adherence to the fact that unless we disarmed the police and gave money to other things, they weren't going to go back to work. So we felt the integrity of the semester was threatened. Uh, and we had promises to tens of thousands of undergraduates to actually teach them. Uh, so the GOs had to go back to work. Uh, and that's what we had to do when they went back to work, uh, recognizing that they've been safe uh, all along uh, because everyone's wearing a mask in the classroom, the densities are low, 80% of the GOs were teaching remotely. Um, we had to move on. That's why we did it. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you, President Schlichel, for taking the time. Um, so I serve as the director of the Student Organizations Committee, so that's kind of where, what my question will pertain to. So has the university seen any transmission of COVID-19 due to physical gatherings of student organizations that actually follow the Center of Campus Involvement's guidelines? Uh, I don't know for a fact, Chris, but if uh, the student orgs had kept low numbers mm -hmm. in university spaces at the appropriate distance, I haven't heard of any of these, uh, but I, I don't want to overspeak my knowledge. Okay, thank you so much. Great, yeah. thanks. Um, Ali? Dr. Schlissel, thank you. Um, I'm a medical student uh, representative. Um, I have a question kind of specific about the MCARD restrictions and tying that to testing for clinical students. Um, I imagine that's not going to be expanded to all the staff and faculty at the health system. I, I should correct, Ali, before we head in the wrong direction. This is going to be focused on undergrads, um, where 95% of the student cases have been in the undergraduate student community. Uh, so although we want graduate students and professional students to be tested, we'll make it available, we'll make it convenient. Uh, we're just going to tie it to M cards for undergrads because that's where we've had the biggest problem. Thank you. Great. Um, we will move on to Sam Bernstein. Yeah, thanks, President Schlissel. Um, I just have a few remarks and I mean, feel free to, to not respond if you'd like, but um, as an outsider looking in at this administration over the last eight months, it feels like it's been honestly a mess. Um, I've always had an immense sense of pride in the University of Michigan and you know being a Wolverine, but for the first time in my eight years of living in Ann Arbor, I've honestly felt a genuine sense of embarrassment when I tell people I go to the University of Michigan from being one of the last public universities to announce online classes in March to raising tuition by 1.9% in June to you receiving a vote of no confidence by the faculty Senate for the first time ever and the weeks long student employment strikes from graduate students, dining hall employees and residence hall staff in September to the dearth of testing on campus to the county stay at home order that was made as a result of off campus partying which is a result of improper enforcement of off campus students in Greek life to the absolute mess that was the quarantine housing, to which I can personally attest, to being one of the last Big Ten schools to implement a pass no record COVID grading scheme after hundreds of students have already dropped classes because of their grades. And you've spoken uh, in your introductory remarks to some of the changes that you've already made, improving quarantine housing, improving testing accessibility and so on. But I think the question that a lot of us have, a lot of Michigan students have is why weren't these changes made from the outset? And my question directly to you is, why should U of M students trust you when your own faculty do not, as evidenced by their vote? Sam, uh, yeah, thank you for your point of view. You expressed it with clarity. I disagree with most of what you said. Okay, uh, we'll move to Zach. Well, I, you know, I think a lot of my questions were summed up in Sam's questions, and I'm curious to hear what you 
what you disagree with specifically, because I agreed with the vast majority of what he said. And I think that most of the members of this assembly also agree with the vast majority of what he said. You know, I'm sorry, Zach, you know, I tried to explain things as best that I can. Uh, I gave you the logic for each of the steps we did. I told you where we are right now. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure, um, you know, pick out any one thing. So, you know, massive testing, would we be in a different place than we are right now? I don't know, because there are other schools, Ohio State's done three times as much testing. They've had 4,500 cases this semester. So uh, I'm not quite sure what sums up to the uh, lack of uh, confidence other than the fact that we're in a global pandemic and everyone's uh, pretty upset. Can I ask a quick follow-up here? I, sure, of course. i just make a small comment. I Going into this semester, this might sound silly, but on there are groups where people, U of M students make jokes and they kind of spread, you know, memes. And in those groups, people were making jokes about the fact that we as a university going into the semester seemed very unprepared. And they were talking about the changes that, you, that are being proposed right now for next semester and how those should have been in place going into this semester. And it seems like there were multiple officials uh, talking about what needed to be done. And it just seems like next semester is a semester that we deserved right now. And I, I'm wondering, I mean, do you agree with that? And, and I'm wondering why more, why you didn't listen to more of the officials, um, public health officials and the different uh, people, representatives of Leo and Geo going into this semester. Yeah, I hate to keep saying the same thing, just like you're saying the same thing, uh, but essentially we did take the best advice we were getting from public health officials. We took our capacities in real time uh, we modified plans as we went along when we found ways to do things better. And we made it to the end of a semester in the situation that we're in right now. Uh, so um, I don't look at it the same way you do. And um, I guess, you know, the, the, in the fullness of time, we'll figure this out. Uh, but uh, I couldn't have planned next semester back in August. Um, we didn't have the capacities or the knowledge that we have right now. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sujin, you can go ahead. Hi, um, I wanted to ask for some clarity about next semester's plans. So you mentioned this earlier, but people with leases aren't able to break them without paying some kind of penalty or asking their landlord and that's likely not gonna happen. Um, and most people who aren't in dorms have already signed and have housing already. And these people are likely to come back even if they don't have in-person obligations on campus. Were you all aware, are you all aware of that situation? Was this considered in the planning at all? Or do you have contingency plans to include this? Uh, if I understand you, you know, my hope and my instructions and my request to students that no longer have on-campus housing is to go home and stay with your family for the spring semester. That's the safest place you can be. Uh, I can't force people to do that. I don't really, you know, uh, I don't think it's proper for me to force people to do it. Uh, I think a bad outcome would be students piling in in high density into small apartments. I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, but uh, you know, all that we can do is explain to people what we think is best to keep you as safe as possible. Uh, in the dorms, we received the strong advice to go down to single rooms because our experience with double rooms did not work out. Uh, and because of the numbers of cases in the dorms, instead of having 6,000 students, we'd end up having less than half that number to decrease the transmission of the disease based on what we learned in the fall. Uh, but the safest place for students that uh, can't stay in the dorms is to go home. Could I ask a question? No, to their permanent home. Okay. Carla, is that okay? Or are um, there... No, I'm sorry, we have to move on because we oh. don't have much time left. Andrea? I have time left for one more question. Um, hello, um, so thank you for joining us outside of normal business hours. Um, of course, I know you're aware of like the $500 um, international student fee. Um, so already I would argue that international students are receiving inadequate services that don't cater to their needs as well as they do to domestic students like myself. Um, and I think we see this compounded by the fact that there's a lot of international students right now who are studying remotely from their home countries. And they're doing this from like very different time zones. You know, they're staying up like all night and it's you know, very difficult for them. And I'm wondering in what particular ways you're planning to increase transparency for the fee and also to use this fee to better serve these students who are studying remotely and who are experiencing what I would argue is an inequitable educational experience. 
yeah, you know, I feel most badly for students that are abroad <coughs> that cannot uh, get back to Ann Arbor. Uh, but you know, all students are being encouraged to study remotely if they can. Uh, international students that are first semester international students, they have to be in person. Uh, uh, otherwise, by visa, um, they have to have at least one in-person class. Otherwise, they won't get the visa to come to the United States. So we're working with those students one at a time to make sure they have at least one qualifying in-person class experience so they can keep their legal status. Uh, the decision to add an international fee was made by the board several years ago. Uh, many universities have an international fee. Uh, Michigan was an outlier amongst many universities and the board made the decision to add an international fee. I, I don't have much more to say about that in particular. So I don't know if I have time, but I, my question was more, cause I am aware of the whole background. Um, okay. Been working with this for a couple of years or since the fee started a year and a half ago. Um, it was more, how is the fee gonna be used um, to serve these students who are studying remotely? Um, so like many students like in China cannot come and can't, don't have the option of doing an in-person class because yeah. the consulates are all closed and yeah. travel's restricted. So I'm wondering what are some university initiatives to serve these students who are, have no option but to be online? Um, yeah, the only, I only know of one, but there may be more, uh, Andrea, it just may be something I don't have depth of knowledge in. Uh, but we're using a couple of partner universities in China uh, to be the physical location for students. In one example, in Shanghai at SJTU, to go and uh, do their online studies uh, in a location where they can be with one another and get some support. Uh, but beyond that, I'm not aware of the details of new things we've done during the pandemic specifically targeted to international students that are abroad. Uh, for students that are here and you know before the chaos of the pandemic uh, we were making increasing investments in our international student services uh, and again i'd have to get back to you on the details of those investments andrea great um so i know you mentioned that you had time for one more question so that was it um so and we also ran out of time um so i'd just like to thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today um, we really appreciate you taking the time, especially like some mentioned out of business hours. So, um, well, business hours for me are 24 seven and, you know, thank you all for the questions and, you know, whether we end up agreeing or disagreeing, I tried to be as honest with you as I could about how I'm thinking. And I appreciate you guys doing the same. And so have a good and safe uh, Thanksgiving, a strong end to your semester, uh, and, uh, you know, stay healthy. Thank you. Thanks. You too.